Darkness is not an affirmative force. It simply reoccupies the space vacated by the light. This is the Hamilton Corner on American Family Radio. It should be uncomfortable for a believer to live as a hypocrite. Delivering people out of the bondage of mainstream media. And the philosophies of this world. God has called you and me to be his ambassadors. Even in this dark moment. Let's not miss our moment. And now, the Hamilton Corner. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Hamilton Corner here on American Family Radio. I'm your host, Abraham Hamilton III. Mr. J. Mack, producer extraordinaire, often imitated but never duplicated. This man in the controls for today's program, and we're ready to get rolling with the show. At this very moment, many of you, if not most of you, are making that transition from your part-time jobs where you generate an income to your full-time jobs where you cultivate an outcome. As you do so, I want to remind you, that what goes on in your house is far more important than what goes on in the White House. It's far more important, which I'm going to get to today, some of the things that happened uh, this week. This will be a catch-up program because there's been so many things that have been happening, haven't been able to get to it all. Uh, things like presidential campaign announcements on the Republican side. What goes on in your house is far more important than that. Yeah, we have F- F-16 fighter jets shooting down what they're calling unidentified objects flying. Isn't that just a turn of phrase from unidentifying fly, unidentified flying objects? So you don't want to call them UFOs? Very interesting. <clears throat> and we have audio released from the F-16 fighter jets that was released this week uh, as they intercepted specifically one of the objects flying over Lake Huron um, in the Great Lakes area. Uh, nevertheless, what goes on in your house is more important than all of that. Those things may be interesting. Those things may capture national headlines, uh, but those things should not trump, no pun intended, what's going on in your home. Too often, too many of us, in an effort to be faithful around the world, we um, neglect our homes. In an effort to be faithful in various uh, other contexts and circumstances, Uh, Yes, we want to be good stewards of our resources. We want to worship the Lord through what we do in our occupational capacities, whether we be entrepreneurs, uh, business owners, or whether we be employees. Uh, But none of those things should cause us to be neglectful of our homes. So as you are making your transition right now from your part-time jobs, where you generate an income, where you make the the quan, all right, where you earn the quan, Please don't allow that to cause you to ignore what's going on in your home. If you have children, do you know where their hearts are? Do you uh, have the opportunity to have substantive conversations with your children? Uh, If you are married, uh, you're a wife, do you know what's going on with your husband? If you're a husband, do you know what's going on with your wife? Um, These are things that should be prioritized and viewed uh, ministerially. You know, I often refer to the scripture in uh, Peter's epistle. Husbands, we are to dwell with our wives in an understanding manner, understanding manner so that our prayers are not hindered. That's in the scripture, man. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord, as unto the Lord. It's not a generalized submission to all men. It's not a submission to biology, but it is a covenantal submission. And I've said this in the past, we often have Christian women who are wives that submit to their their bosses if they are employed outside of their home. They submit to their pastors many times if they are members of local churches. But the only area where they have difficulty submitting is to their own husbands. It's probably why the Lord put that in the scripture. The scripture talks about, and somebody asked me a question, uh, where do you find in scripture the responsibility for husbands Uh, having a vision for their families in order to be qualified uh, for marriage, biblically speaking, and it's in Ephesians chapter 5, when it says, uh, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. The Greek word for submit there is hupostasso, all right? Uh, It's translated into English as submission. The compound word sub, which means under, mission, from M-I-T-R-E, which means vision. The scripture is saying 
the, that, that verse on the surface gives the indication that uh, the submission is directed to the wives, but it's actually a prior instruction to the husbands before you ever even get to the wives by employing the Greek phrase hupostaso. It's expressing the fact that husbands are men who have been joined in holy, holy matrimony to their wives, but they're men who have a vision for their families that their wives are coming under and submitting to. It's also a military term uh, that indicates that this submission is voluntary. It cannot be compelled externally. So that is where that comes from. These are things that need to be fostered and nurtured with great regularity. And when you pour yourself into these, you begin to realize, man, I really don't have the bandwidth to allow the things going on on the international stage or the national stage to, to uh, I don't have the bandwidth to handle all of that and be faithful at home. I'm not saying you should be uninformed. I do this show in an effort to communicate information, but my ultimate goal is to provide a grid through which we navigate the issues of the day through a biblical lens. So my simple point is as you're transitioning to your full-time job today, do so with full intentionality, understanding the primacy that God places on family and allowing that to inform how you engage with your family. All right, Luke chapter 24 is where we're going to go to start off uh, this show. And Jeff, how much time do we have left in this segment? I lost my timer here to make sure. Okay, so let's get right to it. Luke chapter 24, this is uh, the account that Dr. Luke records of the road to Emmaus with Cleopas and his companion after witnessing and learning all about the crucifixion of Yeshua in Jerusalem. They took the seven-mile journey to go to Emmaus, a city nearby Jerusalem. And it is during that, that, that walk on foot that the resurrected Christ comes in resurrected form, comes alongside them. Though the scripture says he was unrecognized to them uh, because they had just witnessed him three days ago <laughs> crucified. Now, so and they had no expectation that the resurrection actually would take place. And so the resurrected Christ comes alongside them. And he asks them, what are y'all talking about? And they respond, man, are you the only guy who don't have a clue what's going on? That there was a man who was a prophet, no doubt, but we had hoped that he would be the redemption for Israel. And then we pick up the conversation in verse 25 in Luke chapter 24, where it says this, and he, this is Jesus saying to them, the resurrected Christ saying to them, he's in resurrected form. And he said to them, oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. I have to pause right here. This is one of the major reasons why anybody who would assert that you should unhitch from the Old Testament, that they're espousing a, a heretical posture because Jesus uses the Old Testament to point out the specific details of the Messiah. This is literally the Bible that Jesus used. Let me get back to it. Verse 28. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven, the eleven disciples, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Now, 
I don't have as much time as I, I, I'd hope to have, so I'm going to just get right to what I want to say. The scripture gives us insight into Cleopas and his companion, the seven-mile journey on foot, that they encouraged Jesus, who at that time they didn't realize it was him, to stay with them because it was getting later in the evening. It was too dark to walk. Yet after they saw and recognized who he was, they immediately returned on that seven-mile walk back to Jerusalem. The thing I want to focus on is the scripture shares with us that though their hope was dashed, their hope was rekindled. The embers of their hope was rekindled as in their minds at this time, a man is un, is opening to them the Hebrew scriptures, opening to them the Old Testament and showing them all the points, starting with Moses, going all the way to Malachi as to how and why the scripture outlined that the Christ must suffer and die and ultimately be raised. And the embers of their hope was kindled, were kindled as they acknowledged after recognizing him. Did not our hearts burn within us as he opened to us the scriptures? It was like they had this tug of war going. They know what just happened to Jerusalem with crucifixion. Yet here, this man, unknown to them at the moment, is pointing to them that, wait a minute, all of this could still be a part of the plan. And they, they want to believe, but they, they're not sure. They want to believe, but they're not sure. They want to believe, but they're not sure. Yet then when he made himself known to them in the breaking of the bread, immediately their hope connected. The reason why I'm pointing this out is specifically that there are some of you who are listening to this program now and a few of you in, who have been listening for quite some time. You've been listening for a while. And for some reason, you started off wanting to skip the first segment when we talk about the scripture in more detail. But for some reason, you've, you've grown to really enjoy the first segment, sometimes even more than everything else in the show. Yet, you have not given your heart to Jesus yet. You have not submitted your life to him yet. But you can be described similar to Cleopas, Cleopas and his companion. For some reason, your heart is burning within you. I want to make it clear to you that burning in your heart, that resonance you have when we discuss the scripture, that is not a natural phenomenon. That is the spirit of God drawing you to himself. And I want to tell you plainly now, do not harden your heart. Do not reject the Lord. That stirring, that resonance, with the word of God as it's being conveyed on this program that you've been listening to for all of this time now is what God is using to draw you to himself. So now you are at the place that I want to compel you. I want to, to encourage you and to invite you to submit your life to Jesus wholeheartedly. Admit the reality that though people around you may not understand it, that you know deep down that you are a sinner. You know it. You know it. Guess what? That's not uncommon. The scripture says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is not one person who is not in need of the grace of God through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sin to bring forth eternal life. So your recognition that, man, yeah, I got some issues in my heart. I have evil thoughts. I've done evil deeds. Even things that people may not know, I know I've done them. I want to tell you that there's forgiveness for you at the foot of the cross. The blood of Jesus is potent to forgive you just as everybody else who is listening to this program and watching it with you right now who are born again. Admit your sinful condition. Secondarily, that burning you've been sensing, you are beginning to recognize, man, Jesus is in fact the Christ. Believe upon Jesus Christ for your eternal salvation. Romans chapter 10. If you believe if, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, then you too can be saved. Thirdly, I would encourage you to do just that very thing. Confess that Jesus Christ is your Lord. And it doesn't have to be formulaic. It can be as simple as you saying, Lord Jesus, I know you're real. I know you're the son of God. I want to give you my life. Would you please take my life? and become my Lord. 
Some guy who claims to be a girl is not science. I'm sorry. You no, did, it's not. You just can't claim to be something that you're not. No, we don't allow people to choose their ethnicity. No. Or their age. No, I can't say I'm, you know, I'm an Eskimo, so provide me with a free igloo. We no. don't let people do that. We don't. You're a male, and you can't claim to be a female, because you're not. Today's Issues, weekday mornings at 11 Eastern and 10 Central on American Family Radio. Sometimes shortcuts are not wise. If that's true physically, how true that might be spiritually. I think all of us have shortcut stories, you know? (laughs) But there's some you don't want a shortcut when it comes to getting to God, do you? There is no shortcut to God. It's only through Jesus. Exploring Missions with Bert and Nathan Harper. Saturday afternoons at 2.30 Central and Sundays at 1 Central on American Family Radio. Sadly, as believers, we can be pretty self-centered and selfish about our prayers, praying for I, me, mine. The Lord taught us to pray the Lord's Prayer. It says, our Father, not just simply my Father, but our Father. We need to pray much daily for each other and pray with one another as well. That's so, so very important for each and every one of us. Tune in to the Hour of Intercession, weekdays at 3 a.m. Central on American Family Radio. Shining light into the darkness, this is the Hamilton Corner on American Family Radio. Welcome back to the Hamilton Corner, Abraham Hamilton III here. I ran out of time in that first segment, but I I just want to close the loop on what I was saying. Uh, That, man, if your heart is burning within you and has been burning with you, uh, don't continue to, to, to resist. Give your life to Jesus. Submit your way to him. And as I said in the previous segment, it doesn't have to be, there's not a specific formula. There's not a, you know, a, uh, a pixie dust uh, recantation that you utter. No, Lord, take me. Lord, take me. Because the Lord knows your heart and what your genuine cry is. And if you're listening to me and you are in that position where you're saying, Lord, take me, the next thing that needs to happen is you need to be planted in a Bible-believing church. But the scriptures are exegeted rightly. Find believers in your area who you know are genuine believers and ask them to help you to get planted in the church because regeneration, being born again, is really the first step. Then discipleship must must transpire to facilitate the sanctification process. But don't allow the burning to continue and you not respond to it. Cleopas and his companion said, did not our hearts burn within us? And once they saw that he was, in fact, a Christ, they immediately got up, headed out from Emmaus, went back to Jerusalem. You need to do the same thing. Make an an immediate response to what God is doing in your lives and what God is doing in your life. All right. April 19th through the 23rd, Truth for a New Generation in Paris, Tennessee. Dr. Alex McFarland is hosting this conference at the Tennessee... Wait, let me get the right full name for the church. That's right, the Tennessee Valley Community Church. The Tennessee Valley Community Church. This is in the Nashville area. Uh, You will have dynamic uh, presentations made by people like Carrie Vaughn from Adrian Rogers Ministries. Love Worth Finding. Carl Kirby from Reasons for Hope. Uh, Dr. Alex McFarland and Pastor Bert Harper, co-hosts of Exploring the Word right here on AFR. Uh, They will be there as well. Will and Mickey Addison from Airing the Addisons. They will be there and I will be there as well April 19th through the 23rd. We also, if you come, you might be able to participate in a live broadcast. Shh, don't tell too many people. Don't tell too many people. Uh, Because we will, Lord willing, broadcast live. Uh, the Hamilton Corner live from Paris, Tennessee, uh, during the Truth for a New Generation conference. And the theme for this conference is Truth Matters. Truth Matters. That's April 19th through the 23rd. I also want to let you know you can still register for the Marriage Family Life Conference. It will be July 6th through the 8th. July 6th 
through the 8th at the Cadence Bank Arena in Tupelo, Mississippi. Uh, it's going to be an amazing, an amazing, an amazing conference. But the early bird registration has now closed, so you can no longer take advantage of the early bird discount because all of the early bird tickets, they've now been purchased. Uh, but you can still register. Just go to marriagefamilylife.net, marriagefamilylife.net, and that is where you can register for the conference. This would be a great opportunity uh, to take some time this summer to spend it with us. It's going to be phenomenal. Uh, all right. As I mentioned in the first segment, today it's going to be more like uh, catching up on issues that transpired during the week, but we just ran out of show before we ran out of content uh, that I want to get to. So one of the first things I want to address now is this week there was an additional an additional presidential campaign announcement on the Republican side of the political ledger, if you will. Former South Carolina governor and U.N. ambassador under Donald Trump, Nikki Haley, has formally thrown her hat into the ring. I'll give you a little snippet from her presidential announcement video. It's clip number one. Go. We must turn in that direction again. Republicans have lost the popular vote in seven out of the last eight presidential elections. That has to change. Joe Biden's record is abysmal, but that shouldn't come as a surprise. The Washington establishment has failed us over and over and over again. It's time for a new generation of leadership to rediscover fiscal responsibility, secure our border, and strengthen our country, our pride, and our purpose. Some people look at America and see vulnerability. The socialist left sees an opportunity to rewrite history. China and Russia are on the march. They all think we can be bullied, kicked around. You should know this about me. I don't put up with bullies. And when you kick back, it hurts them more if you're wearing heels. I'm Nikki Haley and I'm running for president. She said, when you kick bullies, when you kick back, it hurts them more if you're wearing heels. <laughs> Nikki, you better, you better, you may want to fall back on that one these days. You got dudes running around in heels talking about, hi yeah. <laughs> they on some Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, hi yeah. <laughs> it hurts if you're wearing, hurts more if you're wearing heels. <laughs> they probably want to say, yes, queen, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh man so there you have it nikki haley announcing for the 2024 republican presidential nomination she joins uh former president donald trump as the only two candidates who have officially made their announcements now this announcement is not a surprise to anyone who pays attention to these things i mean Nikki Haley has been crisscrossing the country <laughs> the, the last several years. Uh, it was pretty apparent when she took the U.N. ambassador position that she did so in an effort to try to bolster her uh, foreign policy credentials because having served as an, a chief executive of a state in South Carolina, uh, then adding to that her foreign policy experience, uh, it was pretty obvious to many that the, the move was made in order to boost her, her national um, resume, if you will, her, her, her national appeal resume. Uh, when asked in, in, as recently as in November of 2022 whether she would run for the presidency, she attempted to be coy and not respond directly, but she said, quote, I've never lost a race and I'm not going to start now. If there's place for me, we'll put 100% in it and we'll finish it. So, you know, she's talking big talk. Every race I've ever run, I've won. That's what she's saying. Uh, but I'll tell you, all right, she ain't winning for the presidential nomination. The reality is this. There are two front runners on the Republican side for the presidency. 
regardless of, you know, I'm, I'm not saying I agree or disagree with it. I'm just saying this is the reality. It's former President Donald Trump and Governor Ron DeSantis. Then it's everybody else. It's kind of like you have, you know, a, the top tier candidates is Trump and DeSantis. Then it's everybody else. And it's widely known that it, you often have people who run for the presidency who have no intention of actually winning, but they want to boost their national profiles. And so I, you know, I could be wrong here, you know, maybe to the surprise of many, Nikki Haley comes out on top. But I don't think that's going to happen. And I honestly think Nikki Haley's objective here is to put herself on the radar to become a potential vice president. Um, she's already been a U.N. ambassador, so I don't think it would be pining necessarily for a cabinet position. I do believe she ultimately wants to be president one day. I don't know if she genuinely believes that day could be as soon as 2024. Um, but I believe, this is my opinion, this is just my opinion, I believe she's running in order to broaden her national profile popularly in an effort to perhaps land at the top, land on a presidential ticket as a vice presidential candidate that she could hopefully, in her view, uh, spin forward to a full-on presidential run later on. Uh, could this be a move that could b result in a DeSantis-Haley ticket? This is something that a lot of people are discussing. And so, in addition to... Nikki Haley announcing announcing there are several other people on the Republican side who have been discussed as potential presidential primary contenders. And they would include, as I've already mentioned, Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida, who to date has not stated he wants to run for president. But let's just be real. The window for the potential of becoming president is not always very broad. And when you think about the record that Ron DeSantis established in Florida, and the popularity he has nationally, uh, I believe it would be foolish of him not to run for president now. You know, there's some people who may disagree. Um, I do know former President Trump has a strong contingent of supporters, but that contingent is not as broad as it was as recently as the uh, 2020 presidential election. Uh, so Governor Ron DeSantis is at the top of the list of presidential primary contenders. You then have uh, Senator Tim Scott also uh, from South Carolina. Uh, there are some who are suggesting, and I think this could be a very form formidable ticket if you have former President Trump and uh, Senator Tim Scott, Tim Scott as ultimately his vice presidential candidate. I think that could be a formidable uh, presidential ticket, but that would be something determined after the GOP presidential primary. So I, I do think that you'll see Senator Tim Scott make his announcement soon enough. Uh, and I think his announcement for the presidency would be also similar to what I'm describing Nick, Nikki Haley's announcement as uh, his, his effort to broaden his national appeal and to land potentially on a vice presidential ticket. Again, I could be wrong there. You also have former Vice President Mike Pence who's discussing in some circles, his desire to run for the presidency. How many of y'all out there want to see Mike Pence flying his hair and all running for the presidency? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say too much right now because he hadn't announced, but uh, these are people who are being discussed as potential GOP contenders. Former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, former congressman, former uh, Secretary of State, former head of the CIA for a brief stint, um, Mike Pompeo is discussed as a potential GOP contender, as well as former governors Larry Hogan, Hogan of Maryland and Asa Hutchinson of Arkansas. Say what now? Yeah. Uh, governors Chris Sununu of New Hampshire and Christy Noem of South Dakota have also been discussed as potential contenders in the GOP presidential primary. Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin, former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, and former Representative Will Hurd of Texas, all of these people have been discussed as potential contenders. And so with the 
uh, prevalence of, you know, potential contenders. There's been conversations uh, about what would be the dynamics. Should you have a small field? You know, what if it's just one on one between Ron DeSantis and former President Trump? Well, that that conversation is completely moot now because you have Nikki Haley, who was announced. So at a minimum, it's going to be former President Trump and Nikki Haley and whoever else decides to run. Uh, But the whole small field, large field thing, uh, some tend to believe that a smaller field, should Governor DeSantis run, uh, would benefit him a smaller field and would make it more uh, possible that he could mount a successful campaign and defeat former President Trump. There are others who think that a broader field where you have, you know, a bunch of candidates kind of like you had in 2016 when much to many people's surprise, uh, a, a, a crowded GOP primary field that included the likes of Senator Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio and Jeb Bush, low energy Jeb, it's low energy, low energy Jeb, uh, Rick Santorum and others. Many think, or some think, I should say, not many, some think that that would benefit former President Trump. You know, all of that, it remains to be seen. I do think a larger field makes it harder for former President Trump and, um, say it this way, harder for people like Ron DeSantis to draw a direct line of distinction between himself and former President Trump. Uh, but uh, a broader, uh, a, a more narrowed field would make that a lot more simple. Now, con- Concerning the news of Nikki Haley running for the presidency, seems like former President Trump took a little shot at Nikki Nikki Haley in an interview earlier this month with Hugh Hewitt uh, when when he was uh, said, well before I get to that one yeah I want to get to this one so first former President Trump said that well well Nikki Haley told him that. Told said or had already stated publicly that she would not run if he ran in 2024. So he's saying since he's already announced for 2024, she's going back even on something she said publicly. But then she took an even he took an even broader dig at Nikki Haley during an interview with Hugh Hewitt earlier this month when he said, "Quote: Nikki suffers from something that's a very tough thing to suffer from. She's overly ambitious." End quote. That's what he said. She's overly ambitious. So two people have formally announced for the Republican presidential primary, former President Trump, former South Carolina, South Carolina governor and U.N. ambassador Nikki Haley. Will any people, any additions announce their intentions to join the GOP field? Uh, presidential primaries are coming up. The Iowa caucuses are coming up. New Hampshire is coming up. The third state in the Republican presidential primary uh, chronology is the state of South Carolina. So it will be interesting to see how all of this shakes out. My wife, Jan, played in the marching band in high school and then in college. They all had matching uniforms, but when they played the music, nobody played exactly the same thing. As believers, unity of the faith, we're not the same. Uh, We're different. We have different parts to play. Mm. But there can be unity as we play our part in Christ Jesus. Exploring the Word, weekday afternoons at 3 Central on American Family Radio. As Christians, we cannot redefine marriages because ours do not turn out according to God's standard. We have to aim for the mark. And the mark, it's not happily ever after. This is a picture of Christ in the church. So God has invited us as two individuals becoming one Mm -hmm. to be a living billboard of what he did for us. Mm. Airing the Addisons, weekday afternoons at 2 Central on American Family Radio. Isaiah says we shall beat our swords into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks and nations shall not lift up sword against nation neither shall we study war anymore and I believe that day is definitely coming that Jesus Christ the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords will bring us prosperity harmony but that's not the world we live in yet 
Tune in to The Awakening, weekdays at noon central on American Family Radio. The Hamilton Quarter podcast and one-minute commentaries are available at AFR.net. Back to The Hamilton Quarter on American Family Radio. Welcome back to The Hamilton Corner, man. We're already in the last segment. Folks are heading into their weekends, man. As you're preparing to do so, uh, please make it a priority uh, to gather with the saints for worship, gather with the Lord's people for worship. Uh, We need each other in the body of Christ. We desperately need each other. Uh, So gathering for worship, guys, is not optional for the Christ follower. It's actually a command in Scripture. Go check out Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verses 23 through 25, 26. You'll see uh, what's articulated there as we are instructed in, in Scripture not to abandon it not to neglect the gathering of ourselves together with the Lord's saints, as is the habit of some. As things continue to advance as they are, the evidence of the necessity of the body of Christ will be made more and more palpable, Uh, more and more. We need each other in the body of Christ. Uh, You don't gather merely to consume or to be fed, as it's commonly understood. You also gather to contribute. You have to contribute, to invest. So make that a priority, Lord willing, this weekend. Uh, All right. Another story I wanted to get to during the week, but I ran out of I ran out of time. Ran out of show before I ran. I mean, ran out of time before I ran out of show. That's the way I say it. We now have audio from the cockpit of the F-16 fighter jets that were scrambled Uh, from the Wisconsin Air National Guard to intercept an unidentified object flying over Lake Huron over last weekend. Lake Huron is in the Great Lakes area, close to Michigan. Um, And the audio reveals that the pilots had difficulty describing what they believed the object was that they ultimately shot down. Now, I don't have the audio for you because the audio is hard to hear, but I have a transcript that I'm going to read to you from where the pilots describe uh, what they saw. So the release of this audio specifically from the fighter jets, the F-16 fighter jets from the Wisconsin Air National Guard that scrambled to intercept the unidentified object flying over Lake Huron over the weekend. It came to us after there was two additional unidentified objects that were shot down. And those two objects were shot down after the Chinese spy balloon. So you got the Chinese spy balloon that I already told you, uh, 2,000 feet, I mean 200 feet tall, weighing over 2,000 pounds, carrying explosive capacity. Then three separate additional flying objects. You know, some people going, oh, it's it's the aliens. They've come to meet us. They've come to greet us. You know, I, I, I read about this. Uh, dude in Israel was talking about we shouldn't shoot him, shoot down these things. These are aliens, and they come in peace. Man, y'all say what y'all want. I didn't see Independence Day. <laughs> I've seen Alien versus Predator too. <laughs> Guys, I'm joking. I'm kidding. But I ain't playing with no unidentified objects. <laughs> So the Lake Huron object was shot down over the weekend. That came after an additional object was shot down over Canada on Saturday. Lake Huron was shot down. The object over Lake Huron was shot down on Sunday. The object flying over Canada was shot down on Saturday. And then there was a third object that was shot down flying over Alaska on last Friday. So you have the Chinese spy balloon first, and then last Friday, an object shot down over Canada, and, uh, and they call them the unidentified object flying. I'm like, man, y'all ain't slick. You used to say unidentified flying object. That's UFO. <laughs> so you had one on last Friday shot down over Canada. I'm sorry, over Alaska last Friday. Last Saturday shot down over Canada, and then last Sunday over Lake Huron. The audio recordings were first published by an outlet called The Drive. The Drive. The first F-16 fighter pilot said, quote, and and the audio is about 24 minutes and 35 seconds long, the total audio for the the Wisconsin Air National Guard F-16s. But the first fighter pilot said, quote, I wouldn't really call it a balloon. I don't know what. 
I can see it outside with my eyes. It looks like something. There's some kind of object that's distended in the air. It's hard to tell. It's pretty small, end quote. Another pilot said, quote, I couldn't tell if the object was metallic or what. Now, I, can, you know, he said, I can't tell if the object is metallic or what. I can see like lines coming down below, but I can't see anything below it. The object is definitely smaller than a car, end quote. Another pilot said it was what they saw was blackish in color and it looked like the container. He goes on to say, quote, the size of it, that would be challenging. It's so slow and so small, I just can't see it because it's so close. End quote. Another pilot continued, quote, you can definitely see strings hanging down below, but I don't see anything more. It's pretty small. I don't know about the size of like a four wheeler or something, end quote. Now, that's on this audio. Jeff, I see, I'll send you the link to all of this, this audio when we get done. Man, I'm listening to that. Say, what in the world is going on here? What are they looking at? The Air Force F-16 jet that took down the object over Lake Huron had to fire two $472,000 Sidewinder AIM-9X missiles at the target because the first missile somehow missed the object. Even the Defense Department admitted, quote, the first Sidewinder heat-seeking missile missed the target, end quote. Now I'm just like, whoa, 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 whoa. So you fired a heat-seeking missile at this target and it missed the first one? This is specifically over the Lake Huron object last Sunday. So you had to fly, you had to fire a second missile? And the second one hit it. The reports state that the object was shot down while flying at an altitude of approximately 20,000 feet inside of U.S. airspace near Michigan. All right. U.S. officials continue to quote, based on its flight path and data, we can reasonably connect this object to the radar signal picked up over Montana, which flew in proximity to sensitive DOD sites. We did not assess it to be a kinetic military threat to anything on the ground, but assess it was a safety flight hazard and a threat due to its potential surveillance capabilities, end quote. Y'all buying that? <laughs> oh, it was not a kinetic military threat, but it did provide surveillance threat. I don't know about that, Chief. Y'all have to forgive me. I mean, I'm not feeling too comfortable with it. But the spy balloons and all, and let me be clear. When I say comfortable, I'm talking about for national uh, integrity, if you will. And I don't mean that as like a moral observation. I'm talking about the fiber and, and the maintenance of our nation as a uh, socio-political entity. But I'm not afraid in terms of my personal personal life or somebody, somebody going to get me or something. To be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. I ain't, I'm not tripping over that as a believer, but I'm just talking about our, our capabilities as a nation and our functionality as a nation. The last thing I want to point out to you, though, that they shot this thing down over Lake Huron. So far, so far, debris from the object has not yet been located. Now, this report is as of close of business yesterday. So uh, this evening, it is possible that they'll finally come out and say, hey, we've we've picked up some of that debris. But I'm like, how, how, how do you shoot down this object? But you, you, you can't you can't locate the debris from what you just shot down. I'm, 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 I don't know. How I'm supposed to take that one. So you shot it down, but you can't locate the debris. Mm, that's what you're telling me. Oh, OK. 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 So we will continue to follow this story uh, and report any updates that we can. But uh, I don't believe these people. <laughs> and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's wrong of me. Uh, but I don't have very much confidence in the forthrightness of our governmental apparatus in our country. Say what you will, 
but they've earned it. You know, you've earned it. You know, you lied to the American people for three years concerning, you know, a Schmovit jab, Schmovit injection. When we knew, we, we have documented evidence that early on, going all the way back to 2001, the CDC director, Rochelle Walensky, admitted that the injections, they don't stop infection from Schmovit. They don't stop transmission. And and the announcement from um, Rachel Walensky, Rochelle Walensky, about the lack of efficacy of the Schmovit injections was before, was before the Biden administration issued their mandate to employers. Remember that? Employers, private employers had to compel their employees to get the injections, which we, AFA, among other people, we filed a lawsuit to fight against that. Um, Rochelle Walensky admitted on national television, on CNN, that the jabs did not stop the infection or transmission of infection from uh, infection with Schmovit or transmission of it. Yet they persisted in, in it anyway. And that, that's just one of the most recent ones. That's not the only ones, but I'm saying there's been a consistent rollout of information from our national government that's just been false. Straight up, straight up false. Straight up false. So they've earned the distrust of the American people. So, you know. That's why I'm so grateful that my confidence is is in the Lord, man. Because if I had to place my confidence in men and in, in our government, <laughs> case in point. Next story, right? The FBI conducted two searches this week of the University of Delaware as part of its investigation into President Joe Biden's handling of classified documents. <laughs> and I, mean, I, I told you guys what this is all about. That's why I have a difficult time um, drawing up or, or, or pointing out this information. I have no doubt that Joe Biden has unlawful possession of classified documents at his house, both of them, at two of his houses, at two of his houses, at... Um, his his Penn Biden Center office. Now they're asking about the University of Delaware. You know, it goes on and on and on. But it's remarkably curious to me that you discover these things in November, purportedly, yet the American people don't learn about them until January. Then we learn that the DOJ is coordinating with Mr. Biden's personal lawyers you know, where do you ever heard that from? You know, and it just stinks. And it just is sad. I, I wish I don't enjoy being right on this kind of stuff. You know, I told Bobby, I told Jeff, I told these guys last year, we weren't even in our new building yet. I, I told these guys, oh, they're going to use Joe Biden to get the Oval Office in 2020. But he's going to be a one term president. And he's and hear me well, I'm telling you again, he's not going to run in 2024. I've been saying this. Now it's looking more and more obvious. And they're going to use externalized pressure. He may even want to run again. But they will see to it. When I say they, I'm talking about the power brokers in the Democrat Party. They will see to it that he does not run. They're going to use this classified document scandal to lean on him. They're going to use his degenerate son, Hunter, to lean on him in private. They don't want to they don't want to completely admit that oh yeah the media major legacy media outlets in our nation Goebbels Inc and the big tech corporations work together to smush the laptop story so that you can win the presidency because they knew getting him into office he'll merely be a figurehead and you have real people behind the scenes running the government. The Obama administration has its tentacles in it. You know, you have Valerie Jarrett and Susan Rice. I'm just telling y'all, they're calling the shots behind the scenes. They're calling the shots behind the scenes. So they wanted to use him because he had a less radical face to assert their radical agenda. Because if you recall, it came down to Joseph Robinette Biden or Bernie Sanders. Get off my communist lawn. They're a talk. 
And so now they've used him to accomplish their Workers of the World United agenda. <laughs> and now they're going to force him off the stage because they're pining for power. And they want to start the machine to put into place their next foil to continue to assert their agenda. But thanks be to God that wicked men plot and God laughs at their plottings. I want to remind you that it is God who rules and reigns and intervenes in the affairs of men. Our hope must be placed in him. And I want to remind you, if your heart has been burning, man, don't resist the Lord's conviction. Give your life to Jesus today. The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast may not necessarily reflect those of the American Family Association or American Family Radio.